Okay, welcome to Did Sid, and this will be a second kind of a series in which I want to analyze uh, the connections that we can draw between works of music or works of art, and essentially we'll be asking, did Sid influence this in some way? Now there are three lines of thought really with Mr. Barrett. Uh, one line of thought is that uh, he was just a very influential person that inspired a lot of people, and that they kind of drew upon him to make a uh, follow-up uh, music or works of art and in an, an indirect way he was uh, he was perhaps providing some guidance into the development of those things the second kind of line of thought is that uh, he was held on as a kind of a Brian Wilson figure a background figure to help write music with Pink Floyd or at least that was their initial intention uh, and that lasted for however long nobody knows uh, perhaps it didn't really last at all it just turned out to be too difficult and so they let him go. The third line of thought is that uh, that's kind of what Mr. Barrett wanted, was to be a background person that was directing things and putting together music still or works of art and perhaps uh, directly feeding them to Pink Floyd or perhaps even feeding them to other bands. And we of course would have no way of knowing any of this. We don't have access to the contracts, assuming that there actually were contracts involved. As we've noted in the Peeling Sid Barrett series, he quite often said that he doesn't care about money, so uh, he may have been doing work with people just out of, uh, out of uh, some other drive that didn't involve money entirely. So those are the three lines of thought, really, for the possible influences of Mr. Barrett. They, they range from completely indirect and you could argue inconsequential to direct involvement with other artists or perhaps even with Pink Floyd and future works. So in the in our Peeling Sid Barrett series, we went ahead and made a fingerprint and all I'm going to do is I'm going to give a Sid score to follow up uh, music and other things that I noticed that perhaps, now this is gonna be completely arbitrary, uh, subjectively I'm going to pick whatever I want to pick and in episode 22, we did a look at Pink Box, which was kind of a, a single that Pink Floyd put out right around the time that they were really having trouble with Mr. Barrett. Now, Julia Dream is a single that they put out not long after Mr. Barrett was, was gone. And this was in, uh, let's say, 68. It was a 1968 single. I'm not exactly sure when it was released. I want to say it's around mid-68. So... <clears throat> There was quite a bit of transition, transitional time from the time that uh, he left the band. And if there was some form of agreement, of course, we wouldn't totally know. Now, there are a few things that I want to relay, and I'll give two links that we've discussed in my other series, Peeling Sid Barrett. One is a link to an interview, an extensive interview with Mr. Roger Waters. And the other one is an interview with uh, numerous people, including his sister, Rosemary Breen. Now, in the interview with Rosemary, uh, about 23 minutes in, she states specifically that Mr. Barrett wanted to make his mark in life, whatever that could be. And he had a habit of kind of downplaying whatever contributions he had made. So you really have to wonder what perhaps he meant by making his mark in, in life, in life in general. Did he have some bigger thoughts or some bigger plans? Did they ever happen? Did he keep working on these things? Did he release other things? And I, I swear I've read somewhere, and I, I haven't been able to find it, that uh, that he felt that uh, most of his work had not been recognized for some reason. What that could be, who knows? If I can find that, I'll, I'll kind of point that out later on. Now, the other video that's a discussion with Mr. Roger Waters, uh, he announces quite a few things, and I just want to run through them. The first thing that he relays, and this is about 35 minutes into his video, he recounts the chaos that was associated with the America tour and how very, very difficult Mr. Barrett was being, how difficult it was to work with him. And there are various reasons for that. Some people say that uh, he was schizophrenic. I'm not a trained professional. I haven't studied Mr. Barrett. I don't know. I'm not at liberty to say whether or not the man was suffering from schizophrenia. And 
I will point out that nobody else who is alive now would either, uh, except for perhaps one person that may have been a professional that actually evaluated him. Uh, Mr. Waters also relays secondarily that they planned to keep him on initially as a writer with the band. And then he goes on to discuss, thirdly, how his own writing developed and how it was necessary to, to kind of take over the place of Mr. Barrett. And he points out kind of his two methods of writing. One is kind of a Corporal Clegg, which is a very clunky form of rhyme, uh, very simple, and reminds me quite a bit of Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk. Uh, there's not a whole lot of poetic um, it's just very, very rhythm, uh, bass and drum driven kind of lyric writing. And then he also mentions this idea of um, the song Echoes and being able to relate to other people and how people are kind of interconnected in a way. And he mentions that was kind of his breakthrough. And I just want to point out that that is a long time from when Mr. Barrett left the group. From, from Piper at the Gates of Dawn until the metal album, which is where Echoes is. That's quite a bit of time. I'm going to say it's like five years. It's anywhere from six to seven albums. Depending upon how you want to count albums, do you include the, the film albums or just the studio albums, whatever. But that's quite a long time. So who's writing all the songs in between? There are various uh, writers that are noted and given, given uh, credit for work, but you can see that there's, there's quite a bit of time that's, that's involved there. So one of, the, uh, one of the things that I'd like to point out is that in our Dark Globe book, which is written by Mr. Julian Palacios on page 321, uh, it specifically says that uh, Rick Wright is quoted as saying that nobody else was able to write like Sid. So if we're able to find writing like Sid, we have to wonder who's actually doing that writing. And also I'm going to say uh, on page 400 that um, it's cited that the interests that Mr. Barrett was being paid was ended. So he ended a contract of some kind with EMI. The, the specifics are not given. And, and it was renegotiated to some degree by an individual named Mr. Morrison. And uh, let's see, page four, yes, this is also in Dark Globe, page 400. Now, uh, I'll apologize again for the way that I'm delivering these. I want it to be organic. I don't want to be it over. I want it to be overly scripted. And so I'm, I'm kind of running through this material as we're discussing it. Now, that involved a man named Brian Morrison. Uh, I don't know exactly who Brian Morrison is. I'm assuming he's some form of agent with the band or perhaps with Mr. Barrett. I don't know. But supposedly he was renegotiating. That's cited again in Mr. Palacios's book. So again there now that's that's in 1972 that's quite a bit of time you have to wonder what was his role you know was mr barrett being paid simply because he was the person that put together the band was he being paid for the name of the band was he being paid for influences on other things or was he actively producing music to some degree and helping in some ways i certainly don't know so what I'd like to do then is we have our, our fingerprint and with that knowledge, I just want to kind of get things going in, in everyone's mind that perhaps the influences of Barrett are quite pervasive. So let's go ahead and look at Julia Dream then and I'm going to score it with our, with our fingerprint, okay? The first thing I want to note, and if you can pull up the lyrics again, I can't post lyrics. Uh, that's uh, they're they're under publication copyright, of course. So I I, I can't do that without uh, some form of risk to this being blocked or eventually having problems in the future. So the first thing I want to point out is the name of the song, of course, is Julia Dream. We've already mentioned dreams and and 
and spiritual movement and these things are are uh, kind of a cornerstone of mr barrett's work sometimes so that's a plus one right there just in the title alone it's already discussing the nature of a dream <sighs> the very first line immediately rhymes sunlight and bright so that's a clanging on the ite sound that clanging is a barrett um that's a, a barrett tendency of course he's not the only one who does these things but i just want to point out the more of these that we can find uh, the the more uh, confident I think we can feel in the overall influence, perhaps, on this song. So that's a two. Uh, notice that the sunlight and bright don't don't. Um, that's not the first and the end of the line. So there's an inner light and bright, and then the next line and so they end with pillow and i just want to point out the l's there so he's again he's clanging on l sounds and t sounds the next line begins with the word lighter which is of course rhyming the first and first of the first and second line and then he ends with eider down and of course eider, eider down is a very strange uh, thing to be rhyming with that was previously used in flaming so we'll give that three points. And I also want to point out that the structure of this has just has just uh, rhymed the word light repeatedly, which is something that we saw in the song Terrapin. Now, we have to keep in mind the context of Terrapin. That is not released until later. But if this was an influence or perhaps even helped put together by Mr. Baird in some way, it is following the same format of, of Terrapin, where he rhymes you repeatedly and then ends with blue. So I'm going to give that a four. Now, uh, the next line refers to a weeping willow. Uh, or ask the question, is she going to let the weeping willow? Now, the use of animate objects, uh, usually animals to represent people is common to Mr. Barrett. So I'm going to give that a five. That's a symbolic reference. And the weeping willow we've already discussed in our episode on C. Emily play in the other series and how that could be a Shakespearean reference to Ophelia. It is specifically called out in Shakespeare and the death of Ophelia. I don't know if I'm going to find it. I'll throw, I'll throw that on the screen, the exact reference. But at any rate, that's a six already. I'll also point out that there's a clanging on a W. So will, weeping willow, and the will and the willow are, of course, the same sound. Those are repeated. That's a seven. Now, obviously, okay, anybody can write poetry. But to do it really, really well is not an easy thing to do. So... <clears throat> The consistent use of consonants of the W sound and the L sound there that's seamlessly thrown together is a very beautiful thing, and very few people can do that. I just want to point that out. Now, the next line, he asks if, if she will let the weeping willow. There is a reference to sadness, hidden sadness. That's an eight. Uh, Sid score of an eight. Now he mentions or transforms the willow's uh, arms to branches. So he's asking if if she's going to let this willow embrace her. A very poetic way, I would say, of being together in some way. You can take that as a simple hug or a more sexual reference if you choose. Doesn't matter to me. All that matters to me is that there is an artful reference of a tree metaphor to a person being able to be with someone that they really, really care about. So uh, we get to the, the chorus here um, where he mentions that uh, there's a, a Julia dream again. Now he mentions the word uh, dreamboat and then queen. There's a queen reference. We've specifically pointed out the royal king queen reference previously. That's a nine now for a Sid score. And she's the queen of his dreams. I'll point out that also he is using dream repeatedly and he's using the end of each line here in the chorus to call out the next line. So 
the first line ends with dream the next line begins with dream and then ends with queen the next line begins with queen and and ends with dreams so again playing on two words for the entirety of that I'll give that a 10 it is a very very odd thing to do and it is not easy to sing <laughs> I'll point out <clears throat> now I've been messing with this song for a little bit if you want to see my version of the song I put together really quick with a painting you can do that um, I guess just look up uh, Julia Dream cover or you can check my channel out for paintings and covers of songs but uh, I have tried many, many times to sing this by memory, and the flow of the words is so strange. Just for example, the very first line, sunlight bright, upon. There's no verb there. That's not a regular sentence. It's not a... So he's almost forming, as we stated before, a compact haiku, um, a series of images or ideas that are not um, correct, and but are extremely poetic and are relaying images and thoughts and ideas whoever wrote this is doing that i don't mean to say that sid wrote this i don't know necessarily that sid did write this i'm saying whoever did write this is extremely gifted with words so let's go to the next verse here <clears throat> there's a mention to turning out the lights every night again clanging uh, i'm going to give that an 11. Again, using the L and the T sound. And he mentions that he's waiting. And he mentions a velvet bride. Okay, now I want to check that out for two reasons. Uh, first is that velvet is the first very, very interesting word that's used here. It's easily overlooked. And it's not easily understood. And I'm not going to suggest I do understand it, but... What exactly is a, is a Velvet Bride? I also want to point out that um, he's saying he's waiting for a Velvet Bride. If he was waiting, he could say wife, but he specifically has not chosen the wife sound. It even matches uh, the rest of the structure of the poem. So instead of wife, he has chosen bride. And you have to wonder then, is he saying that he's waiting for this bride because she's not his bride. She's someone else's bride. What kind of a bride is she? She's velvet. There's two things to go along with velvet, ideally. Uh, at least in, at this point in time. Velvet was something that was somewhat expensive. It was kind of a plush. And the other thing is there are two colors associated with velvet. Uh, blue velvet, of course. But more commonly red. Red velvet is extremely common so he may be saying here his red bride and we've already mentioned the connection to the color red i'm going to give that two more points so we're now at 13 points total the next line he mentions will scaly armadillo again clanging on the l sound it's 14 points and what could be meant by scaly armadillo now i don't have a really good uh call on scaly armadillo but i will say that scaly is also kind of connected to the idea of being dry and and being dry is also associated with age so as we discussed somewhat before the nature of a terrapin in peeling sid barrett and terrapin an armadillo is a low animal it is low to the ground it is a a cold-blooded mammal and it has a protective shell so you have to wonder here, and in this case, is the scaly armadillo being referred to? <clears throat> now, obviously, he's asking a question. Is this scaly armadillo going to find him? So it's not him. It's a reference to someone else, and it's not the bride. So who else could there be? If this is a bride, is it related to the bride in some way? Uh, definitely possible. And in this case, we may get a feel for what this person would be like older and perhaps well off or secure lower to the ground of, of course the ground associated with the earth materialism etc so he's hiding somewhere so why would this get in the next line he mentions hiding perhaps he's hiding with the bride perhaps the light uh, turning the light out doesn't necessarily refer to 
um, putting it, turning it off, but perhaps putting it outside. In other words, leaving a signal for uh, a lover of some kind to come visit. Uh, again, all this is just uh, speculatory or speculative. I'm not going to say that I know exactly what the song is about, but it is very interesting. And I think you could say that perhaps um, it's drawing a lot of correlations to what we already know about uh, Mr. Barrett's tendencies. Now there's a reference to Misty Master. The next, I'm not going to do the the uh, chorus again. Just go to the next verse. There's a Misty Master. Now again, clanging. So that's 15. And uh, I will mention that Misty has been used previously. That was used in Matilda Mother. So um, I'm going to give that a 16. When he mentions the Misty Riders, in this case he's mentioning the Misty Master. Uh, and, and then he mentions an interesting line. This is probably the most important line in a way to me. He mentions a key unlocking his mind. And then he mentions following footsteps catching him. I just want to point out that the key unlocking your mind idea is uh, neither negative nor positive, correct? So we have to use context. The Misty Master breaking him is obviously a negative thing. The following footsteps catching him is got a negative connotation as well. So we have to assume that there is a key unlocking his mind is also a fear of some kind. That there will be a key that comes around that unlocks his mind. Why would that be so? Perhaps because the nature of this song is meant to hide something. And if it's unlocked, then it would be uh, perhaps um, relaying something about the, the person that wrote this that they didn't necessarily want everyone to know or perhaps they just don't want a scaly armadillo to know uh, and then he asked the question is he really dying now uh, that last bit is a very disturbing bit and I'll try and explain why uh, at any rate so far I would say we're at a SID score of now 17 due to the fear and everything else that's tied to this. Now, the am I really dying bit could of course be a psychedelic reference to a trip. Now notice that, and this is something that constantly throws me off, is that Julia Dream, and then he mentions that she's a dream boat queen. Now a boat of course is associated with travel and a trip, so there's a travel reference. And perhaps this is a psychedelic reference, so I'll give that an 18 total. So. <clears throat> Let's consider then, if you are of the mindset that perhaps Mr. Barrett influenced this or even wrote it, and there's a reference to really dying, that he may have actually, as some people said, have said, that he may have been aware that something was happening to him, and perhaps he was afraid that in some way he was dying physically, perhaps he was afraid that uh, there was... There was something very, very wrong happening to him. Now, I haven't covered that a whole lot because um, it's really hard to know something like that. And, of course, there's no way of knowing if this song was specifically written by Sid in any form. But if you have the mindset that perhaps he did write this song and that last line and you actually are of the mindset that perhaps he was suffering through something very difficult and perhaps was afraid that he was dying, well, it's right there in the end of the song. So that's pretty much it. I'm going to give this a SID score of 18, which is uh, more than four times what we counted in paint box. So anyway, I can, even if you don't believe Mr. Barrett had anything to do with the writing of the song, you would have to acknowledge, I think, in some way that he very much, or the memory of him, or even the way that he made music, very much influenced this song. And perhaps Mr. Uh, Waters was using that to some degree to channel it, to make a song like this. And I would just like to point out that this is, in my, in my opinion, this is uh, poetic mastery. And so if 
if, as we discussed, Mr. Rick Wright was saying that nobody else could write like Sid, I'd uh, very much disagree. Whoever wrote this poem can write very much like Mr. Barrett could. So, <clears throat> that's pretty much it for that. Uh, I, I was messing with the rhythm of this song, so what I want to do is, is, if you are into learning how to play guitar and play songs, uh, previously I said Terrapin was a really good song to start with. I think this might actually be easier, and I only started messing with this song a few days ago, so if, uh, if you want to learn a Pink Floyd song, I'll suggest actually start with this, and there's a really kind of a simple rhythm that I feel f meshes very, very well with the flow of the song, and I'll kind of throw it in here, and you can use it if you choose. Now the chords involved are A minor, C, E, and then back to A minor. That's for the first line of each verse. The second line of each verse goes A minor, and then it goes to D minor, and then C, E, A minor again. That's the chords. And then that, that second chord line that we just ran through, it repeats for the third. Now, there's a really easy rhythm that I think fits it really well, and that's just down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up. You can just mess with that if you like. But I'm going to go through the song. If I make mistakes, that's fine. I don't really care. <laughs> uh, that's just how it goes. So let's run through the song with this really kind of dirge-like rhythm. It's very slow. And I think it fits the song really well. You decide. Sunlight bright upon my pillow, lighter than an eider down. Will she let the weeping willow wind his branches? pretty much it. a couple mistakes in there that's all right so <clears throat> basically i really wish i had used that rhythm on guitar instead of what i i, I just used the standard down down up up down i think or something like that for the video that i made but i'm not going to go back and redo it so that feel of that dirge really slow rhythm i think fits the song really well so if you're going to mess with the song uh maybe try that out it's really easy to do and uh, there's just so much bad news out everywhere. It's really kind of, this is a chance, I think, for for people to experience beautiful things and beautify their own lives and realize, you know, that we're kind of lucky to experience these things and lucky to be alive and consider them. So I'll just throw that out there. If you, if you want to try and learn the song, this is a pretty easy song to put together. Now, there is one last thing that I kind of would like to discuss, and that is tied to the series in a way, but in, and also tied to this specific song. There is a book uh, called The Beatles by Mr. Bob Spitz. This book is, uh, let's see what information I can give you on it. Little Brown and Company, New York, Boston, and copyright in 2005. 
I want to relay two stories. Uh, the first one is on page 147. I'm going to just paraphrase, of course, that uh, there was a Barbara Baker that Mr. Lennon was involved with to some degree. And uh, the night that his mother uh, died or when they had to identify when they had to uh, identify her that uh, Mr. Lennon showed up at her house and they just walked and walked for hours and uh, after some some time until after midnight uh, Mr. Lennon just kind of collapsed and uh, was his body was heaving uncontrollably and he broke down in tears and uh, she had a feeling that pretty much John Lennon had changed forever at that point. Now, if you're not aware, Miss, uh, Mr. Lennon was abandoned by his father, and he only had his mother to some degree, and she was killed by a drunk driver. So, <clears throat> at that point, John Lennon was all alone. Now, of course, Paul McCartney also lost his mother, and this is interesting because Roger Waters lost his father, and Mr. Barrett also lost his father. And if you're not familiar with the story of that, go back and check out my other series on Peeling Sid Barrett with the introduction. Uh, but basically, Mr. Barrett's father died of cancer, and it was a very, supposedly a very painful and drawn out uh, experience for the family. And of course, uh, given the nature of Rosemary and the rest of the family, you can tell that it's probably something that uh, m that Mr. Barrett's father kind of carried on his own. He carried that burden alone. And uh, at any rate, I, I you can find out about it. You can go read about it and learn about it. But the experience of losing both your parents or losing just a single parent at a very impressionable age is something that will affect people for a very long time. The reason I'm bringing up that story is, of course, because John Lennon's mother's name was Julia. Now, <clears throat> on page 424 of the same book, uh, there is a relation that, that the uh, 423 to 424, bottom of 423 to the top of page 424, is a, there's a discussion of the Beatles giving the Rolling Stones the song I want to be your man and that they kind of used uh, songs and would give songs to other bands as a form of currency in some way to perhaps curry favor with them in other ways perhaps you know help them with musicians when needed or whatever but it certainly was I, and I, I I want to point out that I want to be your uh, if, if you want you can go check out that song I'll link it I want to be your man but it sounds so similar to a lot of their earlier stuff. You have to wonder if the Beatles were just like this. We can't even put this on. Even the rhythm of the title, I Want to Be Your Man, it's almost like I Want to Hold Your Hand. It's almost exactly the same song. So <clears throat> they probably couldn't use it because people would be like, okay, they just read it, I, I Want to Hold Your Hand. But <clears throat> at any rate, they let the Rolling Stones use that. Now, uh, I won't say that, you know, John Lennon perhaps may have had some hand in the song Julia Dream. I don't know that. He definitely did a song called Julia, and it's a very long, meandering song with an odd tuning. I don't know if it's Mixolydian or not, but it has an odd tuning, and it reminds me quite a bit of Mr. Barrett's song Opal. But <clears throat> you can check that out if you like. There is a tendency to see connections uh, people want to always see connections. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. All I want to do with this series is point to connections and then allow people to make decisions on their own. If the SID score is something that uh, perhaps... I don't want to throw people off with that. I mean, that's... Don't, don't get me wrong. The SID score is still a very subjective thing. But uh, I can draw quite a, quite a few correlations between SID's earlier work and this song. So... Take that as uh, take that as you wish, and that's it for this first episode. If you've enjoyed it, please like, share, subscribe, etc. It helps with the algorithm, and we'll come back and do some more.